This session is equally as stimulating, and it's my pleasure to introduce Ben Gertzel, who is a top international AI and AGI researcher. He is CEO of Novamente, and he is also Chair of Humanity Plus. Welcome, Ben. So I'm going to share some thoughts on the, the theme of designing minds and worlds to, to work well together. For the first few minutes, I'll talk a bit about some of my work uh, with AI research, which is what has led me to muse about minds and worlds more broadly. Then the second half of the talk, I'll go into some, some more general speculations about how to build minds and worlds that, that suit one another. So. My own AI project, which uh, occupies a lot of my research life these days, it's called OpenCog. I'm just going to mention it briefly here. You can look at opencog.org if you're curious for more details. But this, this is a, it's an open source software project, which is aimed at artificial intelligence and in the grand sense, at, at making artificial general intelligence. It's thinking machines that can think like people and ultimately better than people. And the architecture is as integrative. I don't have time to go into the details here. We have different memory subsystems corresponding to many different types of memory that, that the human mind has, including semantic memory, procedural memory, sensory motor memory, memory for attentions and goals. And we have separate learning and reasoning algorithms corresponding to different kinds of memory that all work together. We've been using this in some kind of prototype experiments to control animated characters in virtual worlds and to control robots. One of the things we've done is, is work with a, a virtual dog that can, uh, can, learn, can learn by experience, uh, learn by reinforcement and imitation. I don't have no time to show the whole movie here, but the, the little the little known in Lindgraf show the ideas in the dog's mind. And uh, basically the, the dog learns to play fetch by watching the woman play fetch. If she sees what she does, it sees, oh, well, she, she wants me to copy that same thing. Then, then the dog will do the same thing. So it's, it's a very simple environment, but it's kind of embodied experiential learning, which is, uh, is different than a lot of the more narrow AI systems out there. I'm working currently with a group in, in Hong Kong, Polytechnic <laughs> University, on a, a larger project, extending what we did with those virtual dogs. And for this, we're working with a game world that's uh, inspired by the video game Minecraft, So we've, in which everything is made of blocks, which is kind of interesting from an AI point of view, because then the AI can easily manipulate and rebuild everything in the world according to its, to its ideas. So we've, we're using a, a Minecraft-like world implementing the Uni 3D game engine. And our goal there, aside from the goal of getting rid of that stupid woman in the red dress, <laughs> we're, 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 we're replacing her with, with animated robots really soon, actually. But didn't quite get replaced in time for this presentation. But the robots will basically build structures out of blocks. The idea is Say, if, if they need to get a battery that's way up high, they'll have to learn to build stairs to go up to get it. If, if there's a big robot coming to beat up a little robot, it has to learn to build a shelter out of blocks to hide from and so forth. So the, the aim of this Hong Kong Hong Kong project is to make AIs that can learn, learn to build things from the materials at their disposal to, to achieve their goals, which hopefully will be the next step beyond the virtual dog and learn, learn tricks, basically. It's we're also working with using open college to control humanoid robots, and this is work being done at the Shaman University in, in China. And we, we actually have the, the Dean of Cognitive Science from the Shaman University is, is here today at the, at the conference, and he, he's one of the guys I've been, I've been working with on, on this. And so far, this is a, it's, at a, it's at a fairly simple level. You just turn a Chinese grad student tell the robot to go to the chair, and the, that yellow object, it, it thinks it's, it's a chair, because it's more like a chair than the other things are. It, it has to figure out how to navigate around the other objects, and then wander and then find the chair. It, it, it's, it's pretty awkward, but I mean, unlike the, the 
a very wonderful demo that, that Heather showed of the now robot. Here, here the system is kind of learning and reasoning on, on its own, rather than having a, having a, a pre-scripted demo. The consequence of which it, it's more awkward and, and less fun. But that's it. That, that's that's what we need to do for, for research, right? That's it. To, to briefly touch on, on some other research I'm doing that ties into the whole theme. If you look at Ace Plus magazine and look for the article on AI's superflies and the path to immortality, another kind of AI that we're working on using the same underlying technology, we're analyzing genomics data gathered from these flies that live five times as long as normal flies, gathered by some folks at University of Cal Irvine, California Irvine and Janesh Incorporated. And we're looking at their DNA to try to see what makes them live so long and finding some, some pretty interesting things. Ultimately, the goal being to help make longevity therapies for, for humans. And in the long term, or in the medium term, I should say, we envision these things all coming together. So the work with animated characters and robots, is, it's not just because it's cool. It's aimed, at, it's aimed at giving the AI some kind of common sense understanding of the world. And that, that kind of grounding of abstract ideas that comes out of engagement with the world and engagement with, with people and other minds in the world. Well, we want to put that together with a more specialized kind of AI that you get from stuff like analyzing genetics data and put these together in an integrated software system to work toward a human-level AI system. Um, earlier this year, I sat down with some of my open co colleagues to try to map out, like, if if we got reasonably well funded over the next <coughs> n years, and if our basic scientific approach is, is correct, how long would it actually take to get to a human level thinking machine? And we, we kind of extrapolate out to like 2023, like 11 years from now, which, which is, was longer than I hoped. I, I went on tomorrow. And I mean, if, you know, if there was an AGI Manhattan project where the government decided to to prioritize building thinking machines in the same sense that they prioritize, say, I don't know, blowing up people in other countries, or, or I mean, or heart disease, for, for that matter, to, to pick up a better cause. I think it could be accelerated beyond, beyond that, with a huge concerted effort, and of course it could drag on till 2029 or, or 2045 or, or whatever, if there are research obstacles I'm not seeing, or if the funding is just difficult to, to come up. But anyway, this OpenCog project, this practical work, is what has made me think a lot about the relations between minds and worlds. And so for, for the rest of my talk, I'm going to talk about this a little more generally. These are questions I've been thinking about a lot. What kind of world do you need to support the development of a human-like mind? Because, the, I mean, the human mind evolved in an adaptation to a particular world. On the other hand, if you're given a particular world, which could be the internet, it could be molecular biology data sets, it could be World of Warcraft, or it could be the world that we are in right now. What kind of mind is well suited to, to deal with that world? So, what I would like science to be able to tell me, which it does not right now, I would like to have a science that would do this. If I describe a world to this hypothetical scientific theory, then this science will tell me what kinds of minds can efficiently operate intelligently in that world. And it's going to be different for different kinds of worlds. On the other hand, if you could, if you give me a mind, be it a human mind, a dolphin mind, or some kind of robot, I could tell you what kinds of worlds that mind is adapted to be intelligent in. And I think mind science will tell us this eventually. Of course, we don't yet have a science like that. So, Instead, what we do is, is, is we kind of hack it, right? We know a little bit about a certain world situation, and we kind of guess how, how you can build a system to solve those problems and be intelligent in that context. And you know something about a class of minds, be it humans or AIs or whatever, and you can try to design a world that, that, that will suit it. It's not very systematic enough. So, on a practical basis, Human-like artificial general intelligence, or human-like intelligence for that matter, it has to reflect adaptation to the everyday world humans interact with. I mean, we do have some generality to our intelligence, which is, is wonderful, but there's also a lot of, of specificity. I mean, a lot of the brain is adapted to 
vision, a lot of the brain is adapted to social interaction and emotion. So that there's specificity along with the generality. And then, as you would say in terms of uh, Bayesian theory, we have a lot of inductive bias toward being able to learn some kinds of things more easily than others, even though we are a general learning system. One interesting way to think about this is to look at other kinds of worlds. So there was a workshop at NASA a couple of years ago where Alan Combs and I gave a presentation and thinking about what would the mind be like if it adapted to a world made of water or gas rather than a world made of solid objects. And when you think about how much of our mentality is like derived from the fact that we live around solid objects, you think about causation. The classic example of cause is one billiard ball bouncing into another. Or think about reductionism, and breaking things down into, into parts. I mean, that's because we are around solid objects and can build stuff out of them, right? So, I mean, if, if you had a mind that evolved in some kind of fluids of different viscosities, like the, the minds inside the Jupiter or something, or, or even, even dolphins who live in the water, although they have solid objects around, like the, the fish that they eat. I mean, I, I think a mind like that is going to come up with a different way of thinking. They're going to think about flows of different kinds, continuous interdependencies and changes, rather than so much of, of reduction and, and causation. And that the interest to in NASA was in terms of if there's intelligent life on very different planets, in what different ways might it think? I mean, nothing to do with it the way that we think. But of course, it also makes one think differently about human <coughs> cognition. Because when you think about it this way, you see a lot about the connection between abstract thinking, like cognition and reductionism, and concrete physical thinking, like building stuff with blocks, like an AI may do in, in, in a virtual world. It seems that constructing physical things may have a lot to do with learning how to think abstractly in the ways that we habitually do, which are not the only ways to think abstractly, but they're ways that are well suited to our environments and our lives. So one of the conclusions I came to in terms of my concrete AI work is that an environment sort of like a preschool for young children encapsulates a lot of the important aspects of the everyday world. And you can do this in a virtual world or, or, or with, a, with a robot. It's difficult with either of the current technologies. So, I mean, it's been a while since I, I spent much time in, in preschool, as I, as I realized when I assembled these pictures. I mean, my, two, one of my kids is graduating in college, the other's in college, the other's starting high school. So, but, I mean, there, there's a lot going on in, in preschools. I mean, you can build things together with others, you can uh, experiment with, with fluids and all kinds, of, all kinds of different substances. And I think that's, uh, in fact, it's Maybe we should all ditch this room and go back to prison. <laughs> That's a lot of fun. If, 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 you, if you compare the preschool environment, if, if you compare the preschool environment to the current virtual worlds, there's a big, big difference in the, the level of richness of stimuli. So this is a, this is a virtual school in OpenSIM, which is a quite good simulated world, but look how empty it is com compared to the glories of preschool, right? I mean, Croquet just shows up to pick on OpenSIM. That's a very nice, like, open source distributed peer-to-peer -peer virtual world thing. You know, the art is great. It's really fun to play with it. You don't have the richness and diversity of both stimuli. And the reasons for this get technical, but I mean, being in a, in a design school, there's probably people who are well aware of it, right? I mean, Object-object interactions in the virtual world don't usually use the physics engine. Rather, if it's like I'm able to pick up this thing in a virtual world, it's because someone in my or 3D is not putting the socket on here that allows the socket on my hand to connect. Which means that if the programmer didn't anticipate I might do this, it won't let me do it. That's to be pre-programmed and into the world. Then similarly, in a in a current virtual world or game engine, the Movement does not work like in a robot simulator. Like you don't control the server motors and the joints of each character. Instead, you program animations in Max or Maya. So if if there's an animation for scratching my ear, that's okay. <coughs> then if a bug goes in my ear, that animation won't let me pick the bug out of my ear, right? So these things could all be remedied with, with work. I mean you could integrate a robot simulator with a virtual world engine. 
and make a massive multiplayer robot simulator. I mean, you also don't have physics of, of fluids, powders, paste, and fabrics. Well, everything is fun for kids to play with, and isn't that as in the virtual world, basically? And again, there are ways you could work around that. You could make physics engines and little balls and different kinds of interactions. But all this is a lot of work. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a movie. All right. Uh, unfortunately, dealing with robotics isn't really a panacea either. I mean, if you look at the environments we actually put our robots in, they're also very simplified without much going on, and without the richness that gives rise to the inductive bias that helps with human intelligence. I mean, even in our robot lab in China, there's not many objects. Robot soccer is, is impoverished. I mean, we saw recently the PR2, an awesome robot from Willow Garage in California. You can solve a Rubik's Cube. Though. So, that, I mean, that, that's cool. It's hand-eye coordination and it's programming with the right algorithm. But it's not like it just like fished the Rubik's Cube out of a bucket and figured out how to do it. I mean, it's carefully programmed specifically to do, to do that thing, which is different than kind of running a young child. So I would rather see a robot learn how to use a much simpler toy on its own, based on opportunities to be finding it and fiddling with it, than see something very carefully programmed to do this. I mean, not to take away from their achievement. I think that this is on the path that, that we need to go on, because they, they made a really awesome machine. So, just to drop the theory back into it very briefly, one of the things I think an environment has to have to support human level general intelligence, it has to have things that support all these key kinds of memory, declarative, procedural, episodic, sensory motor, attentional, intentional, and, and more. And I think an AI system has to have ways of learning that go along with all these kinds of memory, and that all interoperate with each other, kind of, of synergetically. Preschool does all these things. Right now, if you look at robot and virtual world environments, that they, they fall short in, in a number of these areas. So, Looking at cognitive psychology in various ways can tell us a lot about what features both minds and, and worlds need, need to have in order to support human-like intelligence. And the, the interoperation inter of these two things is, is interesting. So, I mean, you, if you're making a baby mind, you need a world that can support the kinds of intelligence you, you want it to, to gain, as well as, as needing a mind that can really make use of the affordances in the world. So, since I'm running out of time, I'll, I'll race through my last point in like one minute, which is more of a new point. So, in, in, in terms of in terms of trying to understand all these things, one mathematical tool I've been playing with lately is using the, the mathematics of curved spaces to understand what happens in the mind. Can, can you look at thinking as moving through a curved mind space? Which these are higher dimensional spaces, so it's kind of mathematical, but. You can model each kind of memory as a separate curved mind space. And this is stuff that Ed Cowher and I talked about in like 1983 or something, right? Way, way back when we were in college together. And finally, in the last year, I started to see how to do this mathematically, to look at this mind space as well as space and time. And those like current and dimensional manifolds and stuff. And I, there's a paper on this I had at the AGI 11 conference, Artificial General Intelligence 2011, which will be, which will be at Google. Just to, to throw out one idea, you can look at thinking as moving along the shortest path through through the mind space. So with, with a bunch of kids, or ultimately a, a, a robot or a virtual character, are building something in a, in a virtual world, you could say, well, they have a certain goal in mind, which is to say to build a tall tower that's really cool looking and won't fall down immediately. And they're trying to find a relatively short path through a certain mental space into a situation where that will be achieved. And you can formalize that so the math works out. And this is one potential way that we may eventually bring that future science about. So I'll leave you with that picture of my own curve. <laughs> that, that's my own curve <laughs> mind space. <laughs> so, right. so if I had more time, I was going to show more virtual dog. But you can find it online. I think I'll turn it over to the next speaker now.